early. <laughs> yeah, I got my big face on the screen. It was up there. Let me uh, make sure I get my time right so we don't go over. Um, y'all good? I hope y'all ain't expecting nothing formal. <laughs> <laughs> All right, before we get started, really quick, uh, come here, man. Oh, yeah, let's do it. C come up here. All right, so this, this young brother right here is my man Noah. All right? So I think it's important. Absolutely. You make sure you, you clap for my man Noah. You see Noah, you say what's up to him. You make sure you clap for Noah's mother, who understands that good parenting is often, often involves breaking the rules. Noah is not in school at the moment, because he is here. <laughs> Noah, the, the cameras are on you, and all these people see you, so now you are famous. But you still got to go to school. Sit down. Thanks for coming, man. Um, it, 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 so here's the thing, does anybody, and just be honest with me so I know what we're working with, does anybody know who I, who I am or any of my stuff? A few people, perfect. Um, I, I prefer it that way. Uh, so here's just a, a short sort of thing about me. I come from here, I write a whole bunch of books, and I travel a whole lot. Um, and when you travel as much as I do, you tend to have the most interesting experiences on the road. I travel about 120, 150 days a year. And uh, which means that when you fly as often as a person like me, you get like, you know, you get your little perks and you get bumped up, right? So I fly first class a lot, right? <laughs> and it's interesting flying first class because um, for anybody who's ever flown first class, you know it ain't really that much different. You just get a little more space and you get healthy snacks, right? Like that's, and, and for the adults, you get adult beverages, right? And that's sort of the perk about it. And you get on first and you get off first. And there are three kinds of first-class flyers, I find, right? You have the first-class flyers who have never flown first-class before, and you can always tell. <laughs> you know, they come around with a little basket for the snacks, and they're like, oh, you know, I don't know, I'll just take one. And everybody's like, you better take as many as you want, right? <laughs> right. And then you have the first-class flyers like myself who fly first-class sheerly because of perks and traveling a lot, and so you don't really take it that seriously. You understand it is a means to an end, and that if you are 6'3", 230 pounds, you need a little more space, right? As all this is for me, it's about comfort. I am a big guy. I don't like sitting in coach, not because anything's wrong with coach, but because it is all the way wrong for my body, right? And so first class for me is literally just like, ah, a little bit of comfort. And then you have the people who fly first class because they believe that they are entitled to fly first class. And recently, I was on a plane with this guy. He was sitting next to me. And anybody knows me knows that I just, uh, you know, I don't have a lot of tolerance for disrespect. I think it's, uh, it's never necessary, especially when it comes to disrespecting people in the service industry, right? Um, so this guy sits down, I'm sitting at the window, he sits down next to me, you know. And I say hello to him, because that's polite, it's morning, right? Good morning. And he doesn't say anything, and so I already know what time it is. Right? <laughs> no problem, right? Hey, look, I ain't about to beg you for you. You know, I'm cool. <laughs> Put my headphones in, right? The wonderful flight attendant comes over as, you know, the way it works usually in, in first class is before you take off, they come over and they offer you a drink, and sometimes they even offer you a snack before the flight takes off. So she comes over and she says, can I get you anything? I say, I, I take a coffee, I reach over, I grab a banana, Appreciate it. Thank you very much. This guy doesn't even look up, right? He just sort of digs his hand around in the basket, right? And he grabs some kind of cookie crisp or something like that, right? And I'm already looking at him like, oof, this is going to be a long flight. <laughs> now, we take off, everything's going smoothly. I have my headphones in, so I'm, you know, I'm sort of zoned out. But I can hear this crackling sound, and it's, and it's bothering me because I, at first I'm thinking that my speaker has blown in my headphones, and that we all know how annoying that can be. And I'm like, oh, now I gotta buy new headphones. It's a whole thing. And so I'm like, all right, maybe it's something else. So I take the headphone out to, to check it to make sure the speaker hasn't blown. And then I realize that the crackling sound is coming from beside me. And I glance over, and this dude who is staring at his iPad is trying to get the bag of cookie crisp open, right? But he's not looking up, he's just looking at his iPad and he's like struggling trying to get it open and it's like, <laughs> it's that aluminum sound, right? It's crackling, it's crackling, it's crackling. And I'm looking at him like, come on bro, like, we gonna do this the whole ride or? 
you know, and it's crackling, crackling, right? And he's looking down, and he's getting more and more frustrated, and he's struggling, and now he's fighting the bag. And then he just gets so upset that he's, he, he quits and just stuffs the bag into the pouch. And the whole time, I'm sort of giggling to myself because he was so rude to the flight attendant, and now he can't eat his cookies, right? And I'm, and I'm looking at this dude, and I'm like, you fool. The bag is perforated, and all you got to do is just take a second to look up, and you can just open it. I mean, it's just, just do like this, right? But he's trying to do this, right? And I just laugh for the rest of the flight. Right? <laughs> Then when I land, after dealing with this person, if Noah wasn't here, I'd call him something else. <laughs> then when I land, I get off the plane and I go to my mother's house. This is something, this was probably the wildest day, uh, one of the wildest days of my life. This happened maybe a couple months ago. I get off the plane and I go to my mother's house because I always go check on my mother whenever I land back in DC. I'm gone all the time and as a person who takes care of his mother and loves his mother dearly, my, my first priority, my first note of business, remember I told you this, don't ever forget this, your first note of business is to check on the people who have always checked on you, right? So I go to my mom's house immediately, bags in tow, right? Here we are. Mom, before I go home, I wanted to stop here to make sure if you see if you need anything. Are there heavy things in the trunk that you can't lift? I'll get those out for you. Whatever you need done, here it is. I got about 45 minutes before I pass out. Let's make it happen, right? My mother is like, I'm so glad you're here because my as my mother says, my programs are about to come on. <laughs> and there's nothing my mother loves more than to watch these shows with me. Right? There are between five and seven. This block of time is like prime time for my mother's favorite shows. One of these shows is a talk show. I'm going to try my very best to not say this person's name, even though the show is no longer on the air. Um, but this person hosts all the shows in this hour. He's a man. <laughs> Family Feud is one of the shows, <laughs> which we have to watch all the time, right? And so my mother is like, look, we got to watch this show first, and then Family Feud comes on, and I know you're going to want to stay for Family Feud, so you're going to have to stay for this part of the show. And she knows I don't really like the talk show. I think it's a little complicated for a lot of reasons, but I do love Family Feud because here's a secret for you all who don't know. If you are a black person in America, you watch Family Feud to root for the black family. That's what we do. It's, it's literally like, you know, I'm going for... I'm, you know, I'm rooting for the Johnsons every single time, right? It's a thing. If you didn't know that, now you know, right? So, so and everybody here is like, mm, that is true. And so, it is what it is, right? So, so I, I, my mom knows that she sort of roped me in, and then I can't leave because I have to stay because I have to see Family Feud because this is a thing that we do, right? But I got to watch the talk show. And on this talk show, and don't get me wrong, I think this person is okay. I just think we're all complicated people, and where this person falls short is I think they have antiquated and backward views on... Uh, sexuality in America, specifically gender, um, uh, gender, quote unquote, gender roles. It's like an antiquated view of basically what it means to be a woman and what wom women need in America from men. I get it. This is complicated. Even more complicated at this particular juncture in our country. I get that too. So I want to preface this by saying none of these are my thoughts, but I do want to tell this story and I promise you it is a very important reason why. So bear with me. So I'm watching this talk show. And on this particular episode, the guy's like, all right, we have two young ladies on the show, and they are here because they want to know how they can make their new partners, these two young men, fall farther in love with them. Now, immediately, I'm like, I got to go. <laughs> and my mother is like patting my knee like moms do. <laughs> because she knows this is going to make me angry, and she loves it. She loves to like... <laughs> She loves to watch me get like all fidgety and then she's like, yo, relax, right, relax. I'm like, mom, this is, something is wrong with this whole thing, right? She's like, come on, come on, let's just see it through. And so the young ladies are saying, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm dating uh, this new guy and this, that, and the third, and I just wanna like really solidify, I wanna crystallize our relationship. I wanna make sure that he really is like all the way in this thing. And so the host, who shall remain unnamed, though I'm sure some of you know who this is, says, all right, I'm going to give you three rules, because he swear he's a Casanova. Right? I'm going to give you three rules that will help uh, your, your, your boyfriends fall farther in love. I'm like, oh, boy. <laughs> Always question anybody who's an expert on life. Life is too complicated and too complex and too different, right? How can anyone have the answer to how to live life? It's difficult. Besides, do your best. I'm not exactly sure what other advice you could give. 
<laughs> and so he says, um, the first thing I'd like you to do, because he's going to send them out on dates, and it's going to be videotaped, right? They're going to have, like, secret cameras on. You know the spiel, right? The first thing I want you to do on your date is embarrass yourself. And I'm like, it's like somebody shot me in the stomach, right? I'm like, what is going on, right? He's like, I want you to embarrass yourself, for, I mean, first and foremost, so as soon as you get to the restaurant, figure out a way to embarrass yourself in front of your boyfriend. And I'm like, I'm sweating, right? And my mom is sort of holding in her giggles, and she's like patting me, like, it's okay, right? The second thing I want you to do is I want you to create an inside joke. Now, here's the thing. I don't know, I don't know if y'all know how inside jokes work, <laughs> but you can't, like, just make one, right? You can't, like, that's not how it... <laughs> That's not really how inside jokes, that's not how that goes, right? It's like, they kind of just happen, and then it's like, this is an inside joke, right? But it's not like, you can't be like, today we're going to write an inside joke, right? <laughs> and then he said, the last thing I want you to do to help your boyfriend fall farther in love with you is I want you to thank him profusely. And now I literally stand up. Right? And I head toward the door. And my mom is like, come on, come on, come on. Right? She pulls the light. I'm your mother. Don't disobey your mother. Right? Have a seat. Right? And I'm like, come on, man. This is crazy. I'm like, Ma, you know this is crazy. And she's like, I know. That's why we have to watch it. We have to watch it. This is how television works. Right? And so we're like, all right. I'm, I'm buckled in. We're going to ride this thing out. Reluctantly, but we're going to ride it out. Right? So they go on the date. The, the, young lady, the first young lady goes on a date. And uh, they sit at the table, they ask for wine. The server comes over, he pours the wine. Uh, as soon as he walks away, she sort of like just knocks the wine off the table. Because rule number one is you have to embarrass yourself. So she knocks the wine off the table. The red wine is all over him, it's all over her, it's all over the floor. I'm embarrassed for everybody in the restaurant, right? <laughs> just knocks it off the table. He's, of course, like, oh, my God, you know, he's patting himself down. She's patting herself down. They're trying to get it together. The camera cuts to the other couple. And the way she embarrasses herself, and this is a woman, she's, she's dressed to the nines. You ever notice how women always are? It's interesting, right? When I, whenever I look at dates on TV or even when I see dates in D.C., it's like, oh, it's always these women who are, like, so dressed and, like, it's beautiful. And, like, the dude, they wake out on sweatpants. And I'm like, what is happening, right? <laughs> if that isn't the microcosm of our country, I don't know what is. Right? I'm like, why you look like that? She got on her good clothes, and you got on, you just came from the gym, you know? So this woman who has on a, a red dress and high heels to embarrass herself, she, for whatever reason, decides to get on the floor and do push-ups in the middle of this restaurant. This is it. And you all, anyone who knows what show this is, you can YouTube it. I promise you this is all true. And she's, this is, I did not make this up for Creative Morning. I am not that creative, right? And she gets down on the floor, and she's doing push-ups on the floor in the middle of the restaurant. And I'm like, my mother's looking at me like, and I'm like, I know, right? <laughs> doing these push-ups, right? And the guy is looking at her like, yo, what are you doing? And she's like, I just in the mood for exercise, right? And it's this really strange sort of moment, and I'm, I'm feeling strange. My mom's strange. The guy looks like he's feeling strange, right? And she's just down there pumping it out, right? Then they cut back to the other couple. And now this young lady is on step number two. And step number two is supposed to be, you have to cre create an inside joke. Aye, aye, aye. And so what they do is she says, look, I have an idea. You know, every time the waiter comes over to pour us, uh, to refill our waters, we'll like make a fart sound or something silly like that, right? We'll, we'll make some silly thing happen and it'll be just our thing. And over time, every time he pours the water, we'll just keep doing it and it'll actually be like an inside joke and it'll be funny because he won't understand what we keep laughing at, but it'll be funny to us that he doesn't get it. So let's just do that, right? And the guy's like, uh, okay, right? Because he doesn't know what's going on. So he's like, if you want, I mean, I don't know. We're just having dinner. I would like to talk about, you know, the day and like, you know, and then she's like, no, 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 no. Every time he pours the water, we'll just do something silly and it'll be so funny. It'll be so funny, right? And the whole time I'm watching this, I'm like, ma, like seriously, it's really strange to watch this happen and, and to have all the onus be on the woman, which is a whole other conversation that I can't necessarily have at this particular moment. Though I will say for all the men in the room, we do not and cannot uh, and, and are not allowed to be exhausted about having a conversation that we have yet to have yet. That's a conversation we'll have at another point, right? Just for the record. Uh, and then they cut to the other couple, 
and the inside joke was something just as silly, right? And I'm just like, man, this is stupid, right? And then they cut back to, for, the, for the final time. And the first couple, the last rule for the first couple, of course, as I told you earlier, is you have to be thankful. You have to say thank you profusely, right? You have to, you, you, I mean, it has to be a sort of exorbitant amount of thanks. And so every single time anything happened, the young lady would look at the man and say thank you. So every time, there was a moment where, like, he, like, moved her wine glass a little closer to the, because it looked like it was going to fall again, right? And he's like, oh, move it a little bit this way, right? And she's like, oh, thank you so much, thank you so much, right? Every time that he, uh, I, mean, I mean, anything, whether it be like past assault, no, oh, here you go. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. I just thank you very much, you know. And it was thank you, and thank you, and thank you. And I'm like, oh, this is nauseating, right? Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Like sort of paying this enormous amount, like, I mean, like a heavily weighted thank you on, on something that this dude, I mean, the host is paying for this meal, champ. Like there's nothing, this whole thing wasn't even set up by this man, but she's paying, I mean, and thank, paying him in thanks. Thank you, thank you so much. Oh, thank you, thank, thank you for moving my chair in. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for, you know, dabbing my face. Thank you for fixing your own clothes. Thank you. I mean, like, it was crazy. I mean, really, really infuriating to watch. And both couples had to do it. And so you had this lady who was down on the floor doing push-ups, and now she's thanking him. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I mean, for every little thing. And I'm fuming. And so finally the show ends, or before the show ends, they come back to the studio. And the host, whose name I just almost said, uh, but I won't. He might ask me to be on the show someday. And I'm going to say yes, just so y'all know. I try to be honest with myself, you know what I mean? I'm in there, champ, let me know. You know? Um, he has them back on the show, back in the studio, and now he's going to do like a decompression. Right? We're going to get the results of this social experiment that has degraded so many people. And so he says, okay. How was the dates, you know? And they're like, oh, they were cool, they were good, they were good. So he goes down the line and down the list, and he says, okay, so how did it feel? And he's talking now specifically to the men about how they felt about the women doing all this stuff, right? And I'm just like, as if it couldn't get any worse. So he asked the first guy, he says, so when she spills the red wine, how'd you feel, like what happened? She, she knocks the red wine, it's all over you, it's all over the floor, totally embarrasses herself. And he says, you know, at first it was really strange because the wine wasn't even close to the edge of the table. It just kind of like, she just kind of knocked the wine off the table. I thought she was angry, I didn't know, right? The wine's everywhere, she's ruined my clothes, she's ruined her own clothes. This was a very strange moment for us, it was a little bit embarrassing. But the moment that we cleaned up the wine, we realized that the entire date was now disarmed that we no longer had to put on airs, we no longer had to do any of those things, that the embarrassment of spilling that wine sort of brought the date down a notch, and now we could just have conversation, because it couldn't get any worse than that, right? It can't, right, you, you knock the edge, the cool is over, right? The romance is over, and now we can just be who we are on a normal, like normally, and, and engage in a, in a normal conversation over dinner. And I was like, oh, right? For me, I'm like, mm, I'm, I'm open to this, like, that's interesting. And she, he asked the second guy, he's like, oh, well, your girlfriend was on the floor doing push-ups. What was that like for you? He said, I was confused, obviously. <laughs> but we do share this sort of, like, love for physical fitness. I just didn't think this was an appropriate time to be doing push-ups. He said, but then what I realized is that, like, I'm watching her do these push-ups, and I'm watching the whole restaurant look at her, and then they look at me. They look at her. They look at me. They look at her. They look at me. I'm embarrassed, she's embarrassed, they're embarrassed for us both and confused, and then I realized there's only one thing I can do since I can't seem to get her up off the floor, so I got down on the floor and started to do push-ups with her. <laughs> and the host is like, really? And he's like, yeah, yeah, I got down there because I was like, I guess this is what we're doing, right? <laughs> doing push-ups. He said, and after that, when we finally got off the floor doing push-ups, the date went rather smoothly and it was cool. We just laughed about it, it was funny and strange, but funny. They cut back and he says, well, what about the second part? The second rule was you have to create an inside joke. And the guy said exactly what I said. He was like, at first I was like, why are you trying to force this thing, right? Why are you forcing this thing? But then when I, then he said, he said but then after a while, you know, throughout the night, it actually did become a funny thing, only because we were keeping a secret from the, from the server. 
right? And so the server's confusion is what made us laugh, right? The joke itself wasn't actually a joke, but the server's confusion, this idea that we knew something that he didn't know, and when we saw him coming across the room to, to fill up our water, we knew it was going to be hilarious when he didn't understand why we were laughing so hard. That in itself was funny. It's like people who laugh, and then you start laughing, right? And you don't know why you're laughing, but they're laughing, so something is funny, and their laughter is funny enough to cause you to laugh. It's that kind of thing, right? Meta, 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 meta. It's that kind of thing, right? So he starts, he's like, so it actually kind of worked out. And throughout the night, I really enjoyed watching the server pour. It became a thing of enjoyment, strangely enough. And then he asked the last question, and he said, well, how do you feel about being thanked all the time? <laughs> and the, the second, the, the workout guy, he was like, honestly, it was a little strange. He was like, because it was so over the top, right? Thank you, thank you, thank you. He said, but then, halfway through the date, it was kind of amazing. And he said, well, why? What made you think it was amazing? He said, because I realized halfway through the date how rarely it is that I'm ever thanked, how rarely it is that I hear those words, how rarely it is that somebody thanks me for anything in my life. Like, I, I, it's just, it doesn't happen to me often enough, and I, I, and I don't really realize it because it's just my life. My natural state of being is to walk, is to move around the world unthanked, and so to thank me for every little thing was strange at first, but then it became kind of comforting. And then sort of they say they all have fallen in love and blah, 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 blah. And, you know, cue the credits, right? And I'm like, whew, we made it. What a trash show, right? <laughs> you can edit that part out. Yeah. <laughs> and so my mother and I stick around. We watch the next show, which is Family Feud. We have a great time. We root for the Johnsons. The Johnsons win, and life is okay, right? <laughs> I go home that night, finally, after traveling and after dealing with all of that nonsense. And I get home, and I check my email. And this is all true, you know, it's so, so funny. I check my email, and in my email, my inbox, there are hundreds, there are always hundreds and hundreds of emails from parents and from teachers and from kids and from librarians and from booksellers and from publishers and all of the things that I have to deal with in a normal day in my industry, my job, right? And one of the emails that I get most often and have always gotten in the course of my career is always an email from a wonderful teacher or a wonderful parent who says, hey, my name is so-and-so, and I have all these young men, and for some reason, uh, your books are working in terms of like connecting with my young boys in my class. I'm not sure what you're doing. Don't even know why it's working, but it's working, right? And so I'd like to know what you think the answer is uh, because it doesn't seem to be working with some of the other books that we're trying to put in the curriculum. It doesn't seem to be working in any other way in our, in our classrooms, but my kids will read your books. Right? What do you think the answer is? Newspapers have asked this question. Radio stations have asked this question. Television hosts have asked this question. What do you think it is? And every time I'm asked this question, I always say, I don't know. I just do the best I can, right? Just try to be myself all the time. This is me any day of the week. I ain't giving y'all no different than I get the kids in the schools. This is it. I don't put on airs for nobody, not even creative mornings. What you see is what you get, right? That's the way I think about it, but that night, after experiencing the trauma of watching this television show. <laughs> I sat there, mulling it all over, trying to figure out the answers. And it turns out that the answers were all there. That this person's name, who I won't say, had actually given me a bit of a gift, strangely enough. It's weird where you find the It's weird how that works. Because I realized that it wasn't about embarrassment on the date. It wasn't about sort of like you had to embarrass yourself. What it really was was trying to figure out how to create an opportunity for humility. And then I realized that perhaps it wasn't about an inside joke per se, this, this contrived sort of way to think about an inside joke. And instead, it was about figuring out a way to create intimacy, right? And then lastly, this idea about the sort of profuse thank yous, right? Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, please, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. It's like, yo, it's just about gratitude, right? There's a power in gratitude. And so when I think about the books that I write, the work that I do, and why perhaps they work, maybe it's because these are the three components that I always enter into writing books for. This is the way it works for me. This is what I'm thinking about. This is who I am. This is what I try to bring to the page whenever I'm sitting down and doing this work. As a creative person, you have to sort of think about, all, for me at least, if you want to sort of push anything, push the line, or connect with anybody uh, through your art, 
maybe these are things that you should bring to the table. So for instance, in my work, how does one bring humility to the page? Well, the first thing I do is I have to sit at the page humble. I know for a fact that writing is always um, challenging in that it always reminds you that you ain't nothing. Anyone in who has ever been a writer, or if you work as a writer, you know that sitting at that page every single time is like sitting at that page for the first time. And you bring all of yourselves to the page, right? The parts of you that are insecure, the parts of you that are traumatized, the parts of you that are doubtful, the parts of you that are arrogant, and you gotta figure out how to push all yourselves away just to find the one that is good enough to, to type a few words on the page, the one that is clear-headed or at least has the ability to tell a story. It's very difficult when all of yourselves meet you there every single moment morning and when you finish that book it's like climbing Mount Everest you get all the way to the top and you're like I can't believe it I climbed Mount Everest so now at least I know I can climb Mount Everest and you go back down the mountain and you're like Shh, as soon as I get to the bottom of the mountain I'm gonna go ahead and climb back up Mount Everest because I know the way up Mount Everest without ever realizing that on your way down every foothold and every handhold shifted and your way up will never be the same again so you're starting from square one every single time so it's impossible for me to approach the page arrogantly because I know that the page itself, that white space will humble me every single time. Every time. The other thing that I have to remember is that I write books about young people, specifically young people of color. And what that means is, especially for young boys, what that means, I have a responsibility. A responsibility to make sure that I get to show them in humble situations. I get to show them exercise a level of humility because whether you all know it or not, black boys in America, brown boys in America have to walk around with all sorts of shields and force fields and layers of skin so that they can survive in the world. I don't have an opportunity to humble myself. I got to walk around like everything is good. I got to walk around like you can't touch me because I'm scared for you to touch me. That's a real thing. So I have an opportunity to put that on the page and to show them crying, show them softer, show them uncertain, right? Show them in moments where they are folded up with grief, where they are laughing, bent over with happiness and joy. Show them scared, right? Show them as they actually are. Show them as we actually are, which means they get to share in this moment these secrets within the pages of a book. They get to exercise a humility that they don't always get to exercise out there within the private pages of, of a book. Every young man wants to see a young man crying. They just don't want it to be them in public. But if you see it on the page, at least you can say, ah, I know that. I understand that fear, right? And then lastly, I have to be humble enough to know that I don't know. I'm not 14 anymore. I feel 14 sometimes. I'm not 14, I'm not 10, I'm not 16 years old, I'm 35 years old, which means that I have to also know when to ask the right questions. I gotta listen a little bit. I gotta be humble enough to, to, to admit that I have to listen to what they're saying. I have to try my best to hear them in order to represent, you can't, you can't show what you don't know. You can't show young people on a page if you don't know young people in real life, right? So I have to sit with them and listen to all of the, all of the things and figure out how to put that on a page. It's humility. It's humility, right? The second thing I, I try to do when I'm writing is I try to figure out how to create intimacy. And of course, those things are directly connected. Right? How do you write intimacy on a page? For me, I use language. For me, I figure out a way to tap into the language of today. When I was growing up, we didn't have any contemporary novels that you could read. If you grew up in the city in the 80s and in the early 90s, there were no books about the 80s and the early 90s for you to read. We had to read books from the 70s, 60s, and 50s and on. We had to read books from 16th century England. Right? All these books that had nothing to do with us. So how can I create intimacy if I don't know how to directly connect to them? And the way we can connect directly with young people is through language, oftentimes. That ain't nothing new, right? These sort of like inside jokes. I got an inside joke right now that most of this room wouldn't get, but some people would. Here's an example. There are, there are probably 20 people in this room who know what this means. That's an inside joke. <laughs> and I ain't gonna tell none of y'all. Cause then it won't be inside no more. But some of us know what that means, right? And um, so, so imagine the people who know what that means, we're directly connected immediately. That's it. That's normal by the way. I walk in any space I'm in, and all of us do it. This isn't just about people of color, all of us do it. You walk in a room, you're looking, you scan the room for people like you. 
Right? In a space like this, we're fortunate that there are so many creative people, so you assume that at least we're all sort of like-minded creatively. But the truth is, is that I'm still looking for me in the room. I have to. That's how I feel safe. It has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with me being able to get up here and give this sort of talk. I need to know where, who, who's in the room for me. I need to know that, right? That, that, that is human. We should not be made to feel ashamed about it. It's, it is what it is. It's human, right? So my job is to put that on the page for the young people to do the same thing. They open it up and they read those first couple of words and they say, yo, I feel like this dude might know me. It's the reason that magic is still one of the biggest mediums in the world. Because everybody wants to believe that somebody that they don't know can read their minds. It's a part of humanity. We love it. Even if we front like we hate it, we love it. Please pick my card. I want you to pick the right card. Right? It's no different on the page. So I use language. I use that which is familiar. If you're writing a novel today, that does not involve text messaging, you've lost. It's their major form of communication. How could you ignore it? Right? If you're writing a novel today that does not involve sort of the way they feel about themselves, social media, sneakers, their culture, right? Youth culture today, you've lost. How can you expect to engage with them if you don't even try? This is simple. Right? So I put it on the page. Here it is. Right? I'm going to write like you. I'm going to talk like you. I'm going to break all the rules to make sure you understand that who you already are is valuable. Right? Who you already are. You are a broken rule, which means you're just a new rule, a better rule, right? an interesting rule, and you're valuable for that. And we connect. That's it. And then lastly, there's gratitude, this, this, this idea that, that you, know, you thank people profusely and how that man said, you know, I, honestly, it made me feel pretty good because I realized that I haven't been thanked in a very long time. You know, it's interesting, right? I hear this, um, this thing, uh, you know, well, I'll get to that in a second. It's, it's, it's just, mm. For me in a book, I, I, I use these books as sort of thank you notes. These are my love letters to kids. It's just my way of saying thank you. I'm grateful for them. I'm grateful for their lives. And the only way for me to show them that I'm grateful for them is to give their stories an authentic swing, to really try really hard to show them as they are and not as we all project them to be. Right? What better way to say thank you? My mother used to always say, Jason, if you want to thank me, live a good life. Live the life that is, that is authentically yours. And so for me, the way that I thank them is I try to write stories that are authentically theirs. I don't care if you don't like them. I could care less. But if the kids are saying, like, this is working for me, and now I have a better understanding of storytelling and literacy and literature, and I love this reading thing, which means that my life will be made differently because I have a relationship with language and I can do things that I couldn't do because I have vocabulary, so I don't got to use these no more. Right? I can process the world differently. Then we win. Then we got to fight and shot in this country. Right? And so these are the things that I think about when writing these books, but there's another element to this. You see, these, these components, humility, intimacy, and gratitude, have nothing to do with writing books. That's just the vehicle that I use, but the truth of the matter is, is that those three components, humility, intimacy, and gratitude, have everything to do with us. Teachers always say, like, yo, I can't get my boys to read. I don't know what you're doing to figure out how to get them to read. And my thing is, like, I don't know what you're not doing. Right? That's the better question. Because if I'm figuring out that these three elements are the elements that they need, it's not that they need them in the books, they need them in their lives. And if you can figure out how to give them that in their lives, handing them a book to read becomes a little easier. Right? We talk about chaos. That's the theme. But when you invite a writer here to talk, I hope you know <laughs> that the way that we think about chaos is going to be on a definitive level, tracing it back like, through, through the entomology of the word. So when we think of chaos, we think of the image that was shown earlier, right? All of the sort of squigglies and the dots and all of the things bumping into each other, right? Chaos, right? A traffic jam is chaotic, right? But that's not really the definition of chaos. It's the colloquial term. It's the colloquial way we think about it. It's the way Merriam-Webster has shifted it over the course of hundreds and thousands of years. But the term chaos, if you trace it all the way back to its Latin root, simply means an expansive space. Avoid. It's where the word chasm comes from. That's what chasm, it, it, it comes from the word chaos. It means open space. It means gap. It means a hole. And so when we really want to discuss chaos, what we really should be discussing, especially when it comes to our young people, what we really should be discussing is the space and the distance between our young people and ourselves. Right? That's chaotic. That's where the chaos lies. In the expansive space there is, between Noah 
and perhaps Noah's teacher someday, right? And how do we make that chaos a little less chaotic? How do we condense that space? And the way we do it is by using the exact same things that I use to write these books that seem to have them all engaged. A little humility. If you are a teacher, if you are a parent, and even if you are none of those things, but you are an adult, listen, the worst thing in the world is to hear adults say that they, that all of our young people are entitled. As I've never known more entitled people than adults. Right? It's a fascinating thing, with the way we talk about them. Right? I hear all of the talk about the, the millennials and the, and the generation after that. Oh, they're all a bunch of crybabies. How do you judge a person and you're angry about young people who are more compassionate than you are? How is our biggest insult that they're just too empathetic? <laughs> think about that, right? You have to humble yourself sometimes to know what you don't know and to accept that. Seriously, like it's, it's a very important thing I think that adults should learn to do. I think that we have to learn to humble ourselves in, in the eyes of our young people. I think it's, it's a powerful thing to, to apologize to a child. It's a powerful thing to say that you don't know. Um, and I think it needs to happen a little more often and you'd be surprised how quickly young people will gravitate towards you. Uh, the other thing is intimacy. This is a funny, funny thing. You know, I think at the end of the day, we owe it to our young people to sort of create intimacy, but you can't create intimacy by only asking them to give, give, them, to give you parts of themselves without you offering anything of yours, right? You got to give a little bit, which means that you got to tell me a little bit of your story. Tell me where you made some mistakes. Give me some of your life. You can't just be asking me to give you all of mine. Teachers, are all, my, my buddies who are teachers, they're always like, yo, man, I'm trying to like pull it out of them. I don't know you. How do you want me to give you everything I got when I don't know who you are? Give me a little bit of you first. You can't be mad at me for not wanting to offer you the intimate parts of myself. I can't give you my secrets without knowing none of yours. That's how we all work every single day as adults, right? It's like, look, I give you a little bit, you give me a little bit. We had this exchange. That way the stakes are equal, right? It's like we both have to have something to lose here, right? It's no different with our young people. Tell them about who you are. Tell them about the mistakes you've made. It's interesting that when we get older, we have this weird amnesia, right? It's like we didn't make any mistakes, right? But the, but the best parents and the best teachers are the ones who say, you know what? Everything that we complain about, all of them are like, I don't know what we're going to do about teenagers today. They're just never going to yada, yada, yada. Teenagers today are teenagers. 16-year-olds act like 16-year-olds, just like you acted like a 16-year-old. I was entitled, right? My mama was entitled. Right? Like, that's not a, it's not a new phenomenon. 16 is not a new phenomenon, by the way. It's just that we are so distant. The chaos is so thick that we can't seem to remember ourselves when we were 15, 16 years old, screwing up every, every life around us. Right? It's no different. When we thought we had the answer to all of the world, every question in the world, we got the answer to it. We all felt that way. It was all the, it's all the same. And so if you want to create some intimacy with your young people, tell them the truth. Tell them the truth. Right? Be honest about who you are, who you were, what you deal with now. I think you'd be surprised at how well they can hold that, that, those secrets, how well they can sort of comfort you and blanket those secrets. You'd be surprised. And then they'll give you a little bit of themselves. And then you can do some real work. And then we can really help them. Right? And then lastly is gratitude. If you're a teacher, if you work in education, if you work in service, if you work in anything that has to do with young people, you should ask yourself honestly how often you thank them for anything. As adults, we feel like we are entitled to gratitude. Young people owe us respect. They owe us gratitude. Oof, what an unhealthy and dangerous way to live. The truth of the matter is, is that if you work in the school system, especially in Washington, D.C., you have no idea what some of those young people have to go through to get to school. The least you could do is thank them for being there. And everybody's like, what I got to thank them for? School is a privilege. This is what, they should be happy to be. You just don't understand. You just don't get it. Right? You should thank them for being there, and then you'll be surprised of how strange it'll feel for them at first to hear you even thank them for being there, because it might be the only time those kids hear thank you for the week. It might be the only time they hear thank you for the day. Everybody deserves a little gratitude. You have no idea how helpful it is to hear the words thank you. Seriously, especially as a young person. And so these books, that's, that's, that's all they're there to do, but really what they're there to do is to poke you and say, you know, these books ain't really nothing if we can't figure out how to do this in real life. If we can't figure out how to close the chaos in real life, and that means that you, adults, us, we, are going to have to be a little more humble. We're going to have to exercise a bit more intimacy, which means we've got to give of ourselves, be humble enough to give of ourselves, and we're going to have to extend some gratitude to young people for no other reason than if they don't exist, we don't have purpose. It's, 
you don't, we don't have to thank them for anything in particular. If they're not here, we don't have a purpose. If they're not here, we also don't have a world. There's no future. There's no nothing. So the least we could do is thank them for the mere possibility of who they might be, let alone who they are today. Right? Now, you could do all these things, or you could choose to not do all these things. And if you choose to not do all these things, well, then you're that jerk on the first class flight. <laughs> and, and the thing about that jerk on the first class flight was that he couldn't get those bag of cookies open. He couldn't get to the sweet part. He couldn't get to the good stuff, right? He wanted it badly, but he couldn't. He was struggling, violently trying to yank this thing open like so many of us do with our children, right? Pressuring and aggressively trying to open them because we feel like we, we deserve whatever is inside that bag, right? I, I, you owe it to me to give, me, give of yourself to me when all he really had to do and all you really have to do is look up for a moment, pay attention. The bag is perforated. <laughs> they are perforated. It was literally made for you to open. They were literally made for you to open. But you gotta pay attention to them first. I hope you had a good creative morning. I hope you have a good creative day. My name is Jason Lennox. Read all my books. <laughs>